I understand you have gone to the point of learning about the uh, French um, history and you have just got to the Sun Barthelemy. I'm going to be uh, giving you a little bit of timeline to help you to understand more of the French Revolution and, and explain what we're talking about. Um, so what I'm going to cover today is the impact of the French Revolution on the monarchy, the Catholic Church, and the Huguenots. And you're going to see all of this really come together. Um, it is said that the French Revolution was the mother of all modern revolutions. And I, I really believe that. I'm actually working on a book now. For, I'm a, a friend of mine who's writing a world book. We're going to put that into English. It's called La Révolution et les Révolutions, the Revolution and the other revolutions. And this man is actually doing a study based on the French Revolution, how that impacted any other revolutions that took place in the history after the French Revolution. Um, following the French Revolution, most modern revolution has sought to destroy any existing society in order to rebuild a new society based on human reason. Human reason, or what we call rationalism, rejects God and believes in man as the ultimate authority. Revol re revolutionaries are convinced that nothing can or will stop man from deciding and carrying out what he wants. The famous Dostoevsky said, if God does not exist, then all is permissible. So to understand the French Revolution, we need to understand what the powers then were. In other words, what led to the French Revolution? What provoked people to revolt? And the answer, the short answer, is, which we're going to talk about is the corruption of the monarchy and the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. So let's put some dates back to go back to 1515 with King François I, Francis I. We had at that time a period of incredible massive buildings of sumptuous chateaux, castles, such as Chambord, Blois, etc. This is also the time of great explorers who discovered new continents like America. This is also the timing of the printing press, you remember, in, with Gutenberg in 1450. And that means that people have more access to literature. This is the Renaissance time, characterized by unprecedented thirst for, in anger for all kinds of knowledge, intellectual knowledge, scientific knowledge, artistic knowledge, and literature means also that for the common people, they had access to the Bible, and therefore able to compare the sacred text with what the Roman Catholic Church was then teaching. And of course, that created a lot, of, a lot of questioning, and this questioning eventually led to people rejecting the teaching of the Catholic Church. Another good date, 1517. This is when the Protestant was more like officially uh, created with Martin Luther. Obviously, there were people before him, but that was not really the beginning of Protestantism. But with Luther, this is a time where officially the, the questioning of the Roman Catholic Church was quite open to all over Europe. And in France, we call these Protestants Huguenots. So let me give you a little definition because many, many people say, what does that mean, Protestants and, and Huguenot? Well, Protestant comes from the word uh, uh, protestary, and there are three ways to describe that word, which is to declare to testify or to protest. And basically what the reformers were doing is we are declaring publicly God's revelation. We testify the five solos, solas of the reformation and we protest against the false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And what these Protestants declare in France, they call them, well, we do all these, but we are also Huguenots which means we are following John Calvin's teaching. And Huguenot actually comes from the word agodnot, which means to kind of confederate supporters of John Calvin. So this new religion created a serious threat to the long existing Roman Catholic Church. 
And during that period, the teaching of the Reformation had spread so much that actually, at once, in the history of France, more than half of French cities became Huguenots. And that was really a threat to the all-powerful Roman Catholic Church. Another key date, 1534. This is what is called the affair of the placards. That's a French word, placard, for the door. But in this affair of the placard, uh, King Francis I, who up to that point tolerated Protestants, he actually wrote something called a conciliar, conciliatory policy, conciliatory policy, granting them limited freedom. Within this freedom, using the printing press, some of the anti-Catholic Protestants had made some, some treaties and posters, and they posted all over France, and of course all over Paris, and all the way to the king's palace, all the way to the king's bedroom. That didn't go too well with him. And then as when that happened, is that he, he, he felt threatened. He said, these people can't even walk all the way to my door, my bedroom. There is no safety. They are going too far. And he started to launch a massive persecution against the Huguenots. This is, uh, so this was a turning point uh, of that. Uh, just think about a little bit of comparison with January 6th. You know, during the uh, former president's elections, when these people got, got to the capital, and from that point on, that gave an excuse to the government to say, okay, now they're capable of doing that. We need to stop any kind of a sort of freedom of going out on the streets and so forth. This is what happened during that time. The king said, no, none of that. We're stopping this craziness. Let's get rid of the Protestants. That brings us to 1541. John Calvin, the famous French reformer, wrote his first edition of the Institutes of Christian Religions. If you read this, you see the first three, four pages is a letter addressed to the king, Francis I. He says, King, I want you to know I am for you. We are not, Huguenots are not against you. And he reminded him that he is ordained by God as a king, but he's also a deacon of God. And so he's reminding the king of France that we are for you, don't persecute us, give us the freedom we need, we are behind you, but remember, we have to give account to God as theologians, you have to give account to God as the head of the state. And of course, this, um, this uh, famous address, actually this is exactly what he says, to the very king, to the very Christian king of France, named Francis I, my prince, and Sovereign Lord, I, John Calvin, wish for peace and salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he introduced his massive work of theology. Now, unfortunately, the king didn't listen to John Calvin, and the king kept persecuting the Protestants. Another date, 1562. The persecutions of these Huguenots finally got to the point where these Huguenots who got killed and fled decide we're taking arms, we're going to defend ourselves, and we have the beginning of seven wars of religions. Oh, yeah. And so these seven wars of religions started then, and then stopped, and started again, and stopped, and so on. But that's a long period of time. And their key leader, someone to remember, was named Admiral Gaspard de Coligny. Admiral Gaspard of Coligny. He was a member of the aristocracy and a national military hero. Now I want also you to keep a few, few names in mind because I think they are truly important for this time of history. Amazing woman, three amazing women. One was named Marguerite d'Angoulême, sister of King Francis I, very friendly to the Protestant cause. She was not officially a Protestant, but she was very, very friendly with the Reformation cause. Jeanne d'Albret, her daughter, she is a devoted Protestant. Jeanne d'Albret had four children, two died early in infancy, and two, the two others were Henry IV, future King of France, Catherine de Navarre, a strong Protestant, a friend of John Calvin. 
If you pay attention to what's happening in this time in the history and you start to see these powerful people very friendly and embracing the, the John Calvin's teachings, that becomes a real threat to the nation. 1572, that leads to what you just studied recently, I believe, on April 24th. Most of the Huguenot leaders were in Paris. For what? By wedding. Which wedding? Henry IV. And you know who? Marguerite de Valois, which was uh, that type, daughter of Catherine of Benici. All right? This is the famous St. Bartholomew, infamous St. Bartholomew Day Massacre. We estimate about 3,000 Huguenots within Paris who died that night. Most of their leaders, if you look at our Psalter, what we see at church, at Christ Church regularly, you see Claude Goudimel, who wrote most of the Psalms. He was there in Paris, he got killed. Admirable Coligny got killed that night. All the key leaders were killed. And then the massacre spread all over France. And it's hard to estimate the number of people who died, but it's about 70,000 Protestants. So, this is, I believe, what you have studied, I think, up to now in your course. So let's get back to 1589 with Henry IV, when he became king of France. In a way, he was forced to become Catholic. He actually said, the famous says, Paris is worth a mass. And so he became Catholic politically, but he was still having some Protestant thinking inside him because of his godly Protestant mother. He was actually called the good Henry King, the king, and he tried to protect the Protestants. So what he did in 1598, he signed something extremely important in that time in the history, the Edict of Nantes. And the Edict of Nantes is an edict that gives substantial rights and religious freedom to Huguenots and temporarily ended the war of religions. That's what stopped the Third War or Fourth War of Religion. Unfortunately, in 1610, that king is assassinated by Rabbi Yak. Henry's successor is Louis XIII. He's then a child. His mother, Mary of Medici, reigned as regent. 1617, that young boy becomes a king, and so he becomes the king of France. Another important date to see how that prepares the French Revolution, 1648 through 1653. France is going through a civil war called La Fronde. This is pitted against, is pitted again against the high nobility and the magistrates of the parliaments. And as a result of that civil war, that there's a division, a divide between the authority of the king and the people in, in power, like the monarchy. And that weakens the aristocracy, the nobility, as well as the parliament. That divide prepared the way for the next king to obtain absolute power. Now let me remind you a few, few terms here because sometimes people confuse aristoc aristocrats and nobles. Aristocrats are people with, with more wealth, power, prestige, and privilege. Nobles have titles of nobility like barons, counts, and ducks. All nobles are uh, aristocrats, but not all aristocrats are nobles. Just little parenthesis. 1661. Louis XIV become kings of France. He is called the absolute monarch. In one person, he embodied the executive power, the legislative power, and the judicial power. He was called the Sun King. He's known of saying, l'état c'est moi. I am the state, I am the government, all by myself. It is the beginning of what we call absolutism that will eventually lead to the French Revolution. All local powers, all other ways of thinking, must be kept under the absolute control of the king. So in a way, 
what King Louis XIV imitated in seeking absolute power was a copy of what to that point the Roman Catholic Church has been. The Pope was the absolute power to decide. The Huguenots' political freedom became a threat to this king the same way the religious freedom was a threat to the Catholic Church. Another date, 1685. This absolute power of the king eventually led to the revocation of the Edict <coughs> of Nantes. Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes that had been signed by Henry IV and had deprived the Protestant for all religious and civil liberties and a new horrible persecution swept all over France. So here's another question. Did the persecution of the Huguenots have an influence on the coming of the French Revolution? Now, many Huguenots were killed. Others fled the countries in great numbers to escape such a place. So they went to Holland, England, Germany, South Africa, and the United States. The Huguenots were mostly educated aristocracy, skilled artisans, nobles, and so the exotics of France's nobles and urban bourgeoisie, which would be the upper middle class here today, who possess lots of knowledge and skills that was very valuable to the nation, their departure, the exodus, weakened France. In the years building up to the French Revolution, that greatly reduced numbers of Protestants and removed a buffer between the working class and the monarchy. And that's something to remember because that's very key there. We're going to come back to that later. When conditions deterior deteriorated in the country, the mobs directly and violently confronted the king. Without the Protestant influence, there was an absence of moderation. There was an absence of voice of reason. It's very fascinating, actually, to compare the situation in France and in England during that time. Because during that time, English society was also in very bad shape. Alcoholism was rampant on the streets of the city. Gangs roamed the streets, terrorizing anyone after dark. The British penal justice system abused the people, and the Church of England was mostly ritualist and dead. England, too, was ripe for revolution. However, in the years before and after the French Revolution, there was a major revival that caused a great awakening that hit England wonderfully. And then there was a second one. So one is what, in 1730 through 1740. And then the next one was 1790 through 1830. And that meant that a great number of people's lives were changed for good as you turn to God. And this, in my opinion, is what kept England from a bloodbath revolution by angry mobs like in France. Let's go back in France now. 1715. Louis XIV died after spending massive amounts of money on many wars against Holland and Spain and England. And so Louis XV was then five years old, and so he couldn't really become a king. So what happened at that point is Louis Philippe II reigned until the king became a Dutch. So in 1723, King Louis XV became king. He was known for living for personal pleasures with many mistresses, for going to war needlessly, and for draining the country of money. Louis XV is best known for contributing to the decline of royal authority that led to the French Revolution in 1789. He died in 1774. When he died, Louis XVI became king, the last king of France. Louis XVI was known for his indecisiveness in dealing with France's crisis, and he added to the national debt in borrowing three times as much money 
as the monarchy had borrowed during the three preceding centuries. That means that he brought friends to a horrible financial crisis. And people started to raise voices. Again, he was a weak man. And the deputies demanded the end of secrecy about royal finances that had been the key element of the absolute monarchy. Basically, they're saying, we want to see the books. We want to see where the money goes. And then the king fired the minister of finances. And there's like more suspicion about that king. And finally, the people of Paris thought that the king was preparing to take control by force because he was losing every battle possible. That leads to one date, which is what we celebrate every year in France, July 14th, 1789. The population of Paris rose up spontaneously. Mobs in search of weapons attacked the Bastille, an old fortress that has been turned into a prison. This was the beginning of the French Revolution, a tumultuous and bloody time. And then from that point on, we have government after government put into place and falling. The National Assembly suspended the rights and privileges of the nobles and lords. Many aristocrats and lords were guillotined before long. Those who were guillotines were in turn who were guillotining people were in turn guillotined themselves by others who took power. This was absolute anarchy and cow. 17, chaos. chaos. Chaos, thank you. 1793, King Louis XVI, the last king, is arresting, trying to flee France, and he and his family are guillotined by the revolutionary forces. The monarchy of France was over. So here's one of the questions about what happened to the Roman Catholic Church. Until 1789, the year of the outbreak of the French Revolution, Catholicism was the official religion of the French state. The French Roman Catholic Church, known as the Gallican Church, recognized the authority of the Pope as head of the Roman Catholic Church, but had also negotiated certain liberties with privilege that privileged the authority of the French monarch. So in other words, the Catholics and the monarchy kind of walked together and yet worked against each other, but worked with each other. And so at that time, we're talking about a population of France of 28 million people, mostly Roman Catholic. As a matter of fact, when the foreign princes uh, and, 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 and officials in Europe uh, got after the, the king, Louis XIV, for killing Protestants and for revoking the Edict of Nantes, the king said, we, we, we can revoke it because there's no need for the Edict of Nantes. You know why? Because most Protestants are gone. So that shows the state of France at that time that was mostly, mostly Catholic. Being French effectively mean being Roman Catholics. Here's an interesting thing. Five years later, after the French Revolution, French Catholic churches and religious orders were closed and religious worship was suppressed. What happened in five years? The Catholic Church, which has been friendly to the monarchy, became suspicious and therefore questioned as well. By the time of the French Revolution, while some of the philosophers appreciated the value of religions for promoting moral and social order, the church itself was condemned for its power and influence. What happened in 1789 is that the government of France took private property of the church away. It's called the Constituent Assembly. They passed a decree that all church property at the, is, uh, should be at the disposition of the nations. If you ever go to France one day, I will take you to near where I grew up, Cluny, which was as big as St. Peter in Rome. And you go today, and they are rebuilding something that has been totally destroyed by the revolutionary forces. What people did is say, it's ours. So they took the stones and built their own barns. And... Now, in 1790, 
the assembly approved the civil constitution of the clergy. In other words, the state decides what the church should be, how it should be run. A constitution whose very name reflected the state's new control of the church affairs. All clergy must take a public oath of loyalty to the constitution or surrender their salary and position. This oath became a referendum on whether one's first loyalty were to Catholicism or to the revolution. And from here sprang a movement referred as dechristianization, which aimed to remove religion from French society. That was the goal. No more religion. That leads us to 1793. On November 23rd, 1793, the churches in France were closed to be converted into warehouse, manufacturing sites, and even stables. Streets and other public places bearing the names of saints were given new, new names, Republican names. Time itself was recast to further repudiate France's Christian past. The French equivalents of BC and AD was done away with the dates. We did. Year one started with the revolution. We start over everything, including the calendar. So no more AD, no more uh, uh, BC or AD. It's day one, the French Revolution. They also uh, changed the name of the months, reflecting the seasons. And the week became a 10 days work, so there's no more Sabbath. That didn't last too long. The French loved their vacation too much. Other such measures were unevenly, unevenly applied and in many cases met with a lot of opposition that reinforced the message that all of the friends, Christianity has no place in the Republic. The revolutionary governments have learned, however, that if you destroy something from the past, it is wise to replace it with something else. And so the creation of the First Republic in September 1792 has given rise to ceremonies and festivals that aim to make a religion of the revolution itself. So what they started to do was to commemorate martyrs of the revolution. They also venerate the French flag, white, blue, and red, which are the meanings be behind each one of these colors. They also uh, put in the place uh, of the worship the prominence of religion or reason. So like in the cathedral, uh, famous cathedral in Notre Dame in Paris that burned a few years ago, they removed the altar and they put a tree. Say, this is what we worship, a tree. They replaced the Christian baptism by Republican baptism to this day. You can be baptized in France, but that's not be a Christian baptism. It's called a Republican baptism. The Christian creeds were replaced by a commitment to follow the Republican values. An interesting name, I hope you get to read one day, a famous man called Alexis of Tocqueville. Anybody heard this name? Alexis of Tocqueville? Well, I'm sure you will read some of that when you go to college. We're actually going to be in July in his chateau and hosted by Stéphanie de Tocqueville, direct descendant from Alexis de Tocqueville. Alexis de Tocqueville studied America, and he, uh, he was a famous French political philosopher and political scientist. He studied that period of the French Revolution, comparing the Amer American democracy and the French monarchy of the time. He was alarmed to see that the French Revolution was, like never before in the history of the world, aiming at destroying all existing laws and tradi Christian traditions and the land. The revolutionary used fear. That's what he says. He says, this is a great way to take over a country. Use fear. I said earlier, the exodus of the Huguenots from France during and after the period of war of religions in France meant that the Protestants were no longer a strong force, either numerically or spiritually in France during the revolution. However, those remaining in France, for those, these people, the revolution 
had met the common aspiration of the Protestants. So that's interesting how something right turned good for them in that point. And this is the Declaration of the Right of Men, the Human Rights. 1789, the Declaration of Human and Civil Rights of August 26, 17, 1789, granted freedom of conscience. 1791, the Constitution added freedom of worship. So that turned good for the Protestants to be able to get back to their freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. Now, during the revolution years, the behavior of the Protestants were not very consistent. Individuals responded differently to the revolutions. Many Protestants took part of the revolutionary meetings, but there was not, much, not such a thing as a Protestant group. Remember, Protestants lost most of their strong leaders during the San Bartholomew massacre. During what we call the Reign of Terror, from September 7, 1793 to July 1794, the dechristianization phenomena of France did not have a great effect on what left, was left of the Protestant community, although worship was suspended almost everywhere. What happened is these courageous pastors continued to hold worship in secrets underground. So, that probably leads to some questions about what happened after, but I don't know if we have time for that, but let me just give you a review of revolution patterns. The people behind the revolution hate God. That has been a pattern. It's called humanism. They replace God with human reason. Second pattern, they hate God's laws. They required, in return, absolute authority under their own man-made laws. And in that case, everyone must conform or die. Three, they hate all authorities established by God. The state is God and has all authority. Four, they hate the Christian values and Christian institutions from the past. They question anything from the past. They destroy any symbols from the past. Remember how we, a couple of years ago, all the statues were fell down in America? Because there is, behind the statues, there was a history, and we want to erase that history. That's what the French Revolution did. Five, fifth, they use fear and occultism to control people. Then they use economical disasters to become the saviors. Anything new? Then they use cows in the streets. Cow, cow. Chaos. chaos. French is chaos. Chaos in the streets and anarchy destabilize the nations. And finally, they took any personal freedom in the name of collecting collective good. Any questions? official king of France. Right. And actually, they're still a king today. We, we, we can trace him. He's a good golfer, by the way. And uh, so, yes, uh, that was, Louis really XVI was the last official king. Yeah. But they had children. Yes. Can you speak at all to the impact of Rousseau on the revolution? Yes. Well, as I said earlier, remember that people start to read for the first time, have access to a lot of reading. So, uh, with, alongside what Christians use to print Bibles and treaties, of course, the, the whole movement of the Enlightenment was bringing men as measurable things. And, and the whole Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, was feeding strongly the whole concept of uh, there's no such a thing as God, 
and Christianity has to be removed. So the, this, the reading of the philosophers of the time has definitely um, uh, played a huge role in the, in the mobs, in the, in the massive people movement. Again, remember when I say that the buffer that would have been probably avoiding the French Revolution was these Huguenots who were reading Rousseau, but also who were arguing with Rousseau. They, they knew how to argue, and they had this potential. They were able to, 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 to counter this new, new movement of anti-God. But they were gone. And so Rousseau had, it was all open for him to go on. There's actually a very interesting list in that book I'm reading in now uh, that gives the name of, of, of most of the people who were part of the, 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 the I would call the, the thinking, the thinking of the revolution. Um, we have uh, English names as well there, but we have Francis Bacon, uh, uh, who is more known uh, here in America. You have uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, uh, Baruch Spinoza, John Locke, David Hume, Emmanuel Kant, etc. So you have this this uh, philosophy philosophy coming in in the French mindset that was absolutely impregnating every 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 school at the time and led people to to basically question everything, including God, and then hearing the other side of the story. Yes. Okay, sorry. Another question. Um, how is the French Protestant and Catholic Church doing today? Well, uh, there is something, you know, that I, I couldn't have gone f further, but let's see the time, but there is something that what happened with Napoleon. When Napoleon came to power after the, the incredible and possible of creating uh, something stable, there was a first French Republic, and therefore they started to reestablish the church. But from that time on, what the church had lost during the revolution, they never get it back. For instance, at that time, Napoleon said, okay, we, we kind of need, uh, we kind of need the, the church back because financially that's good for the nation. And so they, they got basically uh, saying, we're going to give them, bring them back in. Uh, they can use uh, some of their churches, but anything that we already confiscated, it's ours. And to this day, every church in France actually doesn't, believe, doesn't belong to the church. It belongs to the state. Which the Catholics are, in a way, happy. You know why? They have so little money to fix these old buildings. This is our taxes. We're paying, we're paying for it. So a lot of these churches became museums today because they're empty. Uh, that's what you do for you go for concerts. But also when they have a mass, the Catholics have the right to use it for the mass. But the, what they lost in the revolution, they never get it back. Now, not all of it, they were still able to own some property that they still own today, but they lost that. And the, that led to uh, a law in 1905 that was a law of separation of state and church, like we have here in, in America. And that law, again, reinforced the fact that the church has nothing to do with the state. Normally, the state has nothing to do with the church, but what's happening more and more in France today is that um, the spirit of the revolution is still very much there. What happened during the revolution, the bloody revolution, was kind of a, the, the, the tsunami of the time. And over the years, when Napoleon came in power, he was able to refrain that and say, because he kind of need the church. But then the teaching in the church, the teaching of the, in the schools, was diminishing the value, the value of the authority of scriptures. And of course, the, the Catholic Church kind of lost a lot of grounds. And the Protestants, we had some revivals, and then we had World War I, and then World War II, and every time we lost so many of the, the leaders. Today, France is one of the most Western country de-Christianized in the world. So the, we are still living today the result of the revolution. What was broken never was fixed back, except when God brings a major revival and reformation. Yes? Uh, is there any movement to uh, take back the church's property and give it back to the church? Uh, they tried. Uh, you know, once you take it back, it's hard to get it back. So now they try. You know, the church is still a very rich church because they, they, a lot of it, the things that they owned uh, that was never taken by the government then, 
They kept owning it. It was turned into stables and other things, but they still own it. But when the state decided, I want this building, the church had nothing to say. Yes. I'm sorry, one more. Um, are the French people proud of the revolution on the whole? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I don't know if they would say proud of it, but they say it was necessary, they would say. That was the way to, uh, to, um, to make things change because they, nothing really worked before, they think. And that's why I want to compare that with England, because if only they would see what happened in England, they said, no, there was another way to do it. Um, yes, they celebrate July 14th every year, uh, and big time. Uh, they, um, the, 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 what, what, again, what started the French Revolution is still very much in the society today to the point where, um, uh, but, um, where right after September 11th, after September 11, since there was a threat to the nation, what the government said is we need to protect the people again, the state decides. And so the state took a lot of power to decide what is what you can teach in church or not. So they were after the Islamists. But they got to go after the Islamists, they got after the church. And therefore today the church has less freedom. In today, in 2023, the French church has less freedom than we had during the, the right after World War II. And so, again, using fear is a chance to take power again. The state takes power in a point where um, you, your state controlling everything decides what's good for you. And therefore, it takes away your personal freedom in the name of the, of the state, in the name of the common people. Today, as if you, I don't know if you follow the news, but the, the street rules France. All people have to do is unions say, we don't like to take a retirement at 64 years old. It's way, way too old. Okay, they paralyze the whole country, they go on the street, they break everything, and they get most of what they want. The, the, the French politics are ruled by the mobs, like in the French Revolution. And that's unfortunately what I think is, is coming to this country. So, pray for friends. Is, is the French church free to teach scriptural teaching on homosexuality? As an example, um, uh, and you see it coming here, but exactly a good example. If I were pa a pastor in France today and I preach what the Bible says about homosexuality, I could be arrested. I wrote a book in French uh, last year uh, bringing the, the Bible. The, 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 the Bible's understanding of marriage, family, and sexuality, uh, that book could be removed from the shelves anytime. They don't know yet it's there. Uh, but uh, yes, you could be arrested for saying so something like uh, God hates homosexuality and being against it. And that's just the beginning of what the new wave of persecution is coming to the French church. You are not allowed to homeschool anymore. We had that freedom when we were in France. Today you can't. And so there is a movement among Catholics today, about two million people, which is great. But they are the Catholics who are getting on the streets for the good cause, going on the streets against the, the homosexual marriage, getting on the streets against abortion. They are courageous Catholics today. So this is not um, to say that the Protestant one are not there. It's just that the Catholics are still a majority. And those who are back to the church, reading their Bibles, are the ones speaking but um, they are such a minority. <laughs>